All right, starting chapter five. Uh, chapter five is all about special segments inside of triangles. So we're going to be dealing with altitudes, medians, angle bisectors, perpendicular bisectors, basically all the different ways to split triangles into pieces. Um, sometimes splitting sides in half, sometimes splitting angles in half, splitting sides in half at 90 degrees. And then we'll be interested in seeing where all of those lines cross. Um, so there's a lot in this chapter, but it's, it's all about triangles. So let's go ahead and jump into 5-1. Uh, 5 1 is all about perpendicular and angle bisectors. So, first let's define what a perpendicular bisector is. <clears throat> so, the two words have two different meanings here, so the definition is going to involve both of those. But it, it is a line, could be a segment, or a ray that goes through. The midpoint, okay, of another segment. So that part right there, that goes through the midpoint. That ties into this idea of a bisector. A bisector is chop it in half or in two equal pieces. So it goes through the midpoint of another segment. And then this last part is, it does so at 90 degrees. Okay, it does so at 90 degrees, so that is the perpendicular part. Remember the symbol for perpendicular is an upside down T, because um, later on I'm not going to write out the word perpendicular. I'll just do that symbol and we'll know what it is. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we have some segment over here, and we call this segment, and I'm going to put it on an angle on purpose. We have segment AB. He's just over here minding his own business, and all of a sudden... I want another segment. I want segment CD. Okay, so I'm going to draw CD is a perpendicular bisector of segment AB. So CD is coming through and he says, hey, I'm going to chop you in half at 90 degrees. So the first thing I have to do is I got to find the halfway point. Either I measure it or I fold this line. I'm going to ballpark it right now. Right there looks like about halfway. And I'm going to put these two dash marks on there to represent that, yes, this is in fact a midpoint. All right. Well, now I have to make sure that CD comes flying in at 90 degrees. So I have to be perpendicular. So I'm going to come flying in. And something like that. Now, notice this segment does not have to be cut in half, but he is bisecting the other segment. So now I get this little 90 degree mark in here, and now I've met the criteria, once I label this picture, I've met the criteria of what it takes to be a perpendicular bisector. I am perpendicular, that's what this is, and then I cut through at the midpoint, um, which bisects it, and I did it at 90 degrees. Now, just kind of off to the side a little bit, I want to draw something else. Let's say I have another segment over here, all right, and let's just call this XY, and I want to go through the midpoint, but I don't do it at 90 degrees. Let's say that I do it like that, all right, and let's say this is TV. So, in this case, TV is not a perpendicular bisector. Segment TV all I can say is that it bisects XY, but there is no perpendicular in there. So perpendicular is a special one. It's special because it does so at 90 degrees. Now, the theorem, let me scroll down and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do another drawing, but let's talk about the theorem. So there, there's, it looks like two theorems here, but it's really the same theorem, uh, just one's the converse of the other. But basically, here is, here's the gist of it. So I'm going to draw this one a little more straightforward. But I, I have a segment. I'm going to bisect this segment at 90 degrees, coming down. Apologize, my line's a little squiggly there. but And what this theorem says, it says, hey, if a point lives on the perpendicular bisector, so if you are given in some sort of diagram that there's some point anywhere on here, I don't care what point it is, any point on that perpendicular bisector, now, right now, I really don't know it's a perpendicular bisector, so you'd have to see that. Okay, now I'm a perpendicular bisector. What this theorem says is if you live on that line, it is going to be true 
that from that point you are equal distance to the ends of the segment that you chopped in half. So this point, this line and this line are going to be equal. This line and this line are going to be equal. And basically they're mere images of each other. The left side and the right side are mere images. It also works if you're on the bottom side here. All right. Now, you could take my word for it, or if I really wanted to prove it, if I wanted to prove and say, hey, how do I really know that, that this piece equals this piece? How do you really know that? Well, I could prove it using congruent triangles. The triangle on the right here has a 90-degree angle. So does the one on the left. All right? So that's one angle that I have. I also know, because of the bisector, that I have a leg that's congruent to another leg. And because of the reflexive property, I have this shared side here. All right? So basically, I have side, angle, side. So side, angle, side could prove this theorem for me. Okay? I know that the two triangles are congruent. Therefore, if I wanted to use CPTC um, to show congruent parts, I, I could get the hypotenuses have to be congruent. But just take my word for it. All right? Now, the other thing, the converse, the converse, remember from chapter 2, just means the reverse of that. The converse says, hey, maybe I have some segment here, and I have some line that appears to be a perpendicular bisector. Like right now, I think it is, but I have no markings to tell me that. If somehow you're given the fact that there's a point on that line, and you can somehow figure out that this is true, okay, if a point is equal distance from the points of a segment, then it's got to live on a perpendicular bisector. Then I can conclude, oh yeah, this dude must be a perpendicular bisector. All right? So, so the one up top, if you're given a perpendicular bisector, you know equal distance. The converse is, if you know that's equal distance, then it must be a perpendicular bisector. All right? So, so they kind of say the same thing. They're kind of a package deal. We're really not going to do a lot of proofs anymore. Uh, so you're not going to have to get nitpicked on knowing all the proper names, but you really got to be able to apply them. So let's apply these and put these into practice. Example says, find each measure. We want to find the measure of WY. Well, this one is, is pretty easy. When I look up here, WZ, line WZ, is a perpendicular bisector of segment XY. How do I know that? Well, it went through the midpoint and it did it at 90 degrees. So since that's true, I know that this piece must equal that piece. So if you're 7.3, the answer to this question is 7.3. The next one, BD, well, on this one it's kind of turned a little bit different, and this one uses the converse of the theorem. Look at this point here. This point here is 36 away from the end of the segment. This piece is 36 away from the end of the segment. That means these are equal. The converse says, hey, if you're equal distance from the ends of a segment, then that line you live on, you know, this point living on this line must be a perpendicular bisector. So it's perpendicular, and it's got to be a bisector. And if the bottom's 16, BD's got to be 16. Now, just a little word to the wise. There could be some tougher questions on the homework that may go a little further and say, hey, what is AD? What's the length of AD? You know, AD is this length right here. How to solve that? You're going to have to go back and remember your Pythagorean theorem. Okay? Pythagorean theorem was leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So in that picture up above, I have one of the legs. Remember, the legs are the pieces that make the right angle right here. I have one leg is 16. The other leg, I don't know. I'm going to just call it X. I don't know what it is. But the hypotenuse, the side across from the 90, is 36 squared. And now I can use some algebra right here. I could calculate this out and get 256 plus X squared equals, I'm going to have to grab a calculator for this one, 36 squared is 1296. I'm going to subtract 256 from both sides. And that would give me, what, 1040? And it's obvious that side can't be 1,040 long. That'd be way too big. So I need to take the square root of both sides. 
pretty much always do that in the Pythagorean theorem. And the square root of 1040 is... Square root 1040. Looks like it's about 32.2. Okay, 32.2 when I round it. So that that wasn't the original question, but I was just kind of posing a tougher question, a what if, to tie in what we've learned earlier in the course. All right, next one. They want to know what is the length of PR. Well, PR is this line right here, and I say, well, hey, you know, RS is a perpendicular bisector. Perpendicular bisector. So any point on the line is equal distance from the endpoints of that segment. So I know that this piece has to equal this piece. You know, it's true that PR is the same length as QR. They're mirror images of each other. You know, this can also be referred to as a symmetry line, or if we were in grade school, I'd just call it a fold line. You can fold on that line and the triangle should land on itself. So PR would land on QR. Well, now I put some algebra in and say, well, they say PR is 2m plus 9. QR is 7n minus 18, and now i got to get after some algebra. So I'm going to subtract 2n from both sides, which is going to give me that. So i got all my n, n terms to the right. I'm now going to add 18 to both sides, which is going to give me 27. My last step would be divide both sides by 5. I'm cool if you just leave it as 27 fifths. As long as that's reduced, that's fine. Um, you could have put 5 and 2 fifths. You could have put 5.4. But I'm pretty much always going to just leave it here. The, the other things just require more time, and they're not really testing geometry anymore. All right, so that's what you need to know about perpendicular bisectors for now. Angle bisectors. A little bit different animal, same idea. An angle bisector is a line segment or ray that, and I'm going to use my own words here, that chop and, not angle yet, the chop and angle in two equal pieces. Okay? That's what an angle bisector is. So think about this. I have, I have some angle here. All right, some angle, and let's name this angle. Let's call this angle A, B, C. And I want to draw, I want B, D, I want ray B, D to bisect angle A, B, C. All right, so I got to draw D in there. I got to come in, I got to say, all right, I got to find point D. I got to go from B to D and chop this angle in half. Imagine if this is a slice of pizza. If I wanted to break this up evenly, I, I wouldn't chop it horizontally. I would get my pizza cutter, and I would try to go right up the middle there and split it if I could. All right, so what I've done, hopefully, is I've bisected the angle, meaning that I made angle number one equal to angle number two. Angle number one must be congruent to angle number two. If I bisected it, that would be true. And I could show that with, with my little markings there. Now, here's the cool part. Here's what the theorem says. The theorem says, hey, if you have a point that lives on the bisector line, so I got some point just chilling right here, and it lives on that line, or maybe it's up here a little further. Any point that lives on the line has to be <clears throat> equal distance from the, <clears throat> the sides of the angle. Well, this part's a little tricky. How do you measure, how do I travel from a point to, let's say, side BC? If I want to get from this point to this line right here, how, what's, what's the true distance? Well, we've got to remember back from earlier, the true distance from any point to a line is defined as the shortest way to get there. And the shortest way to get there is at 90 degrees. You know, there's other ways to get there, but if I said, hey, run from this red point to this black wall as fast as you can, the best path would be at 90 degrees. And the same thing to the other side. I would come in and be at 90 degrees. Now, what, what the theorem says is that if you live in this point, these two distances to each wall should be equal. And it makes sense. 
If I have a room, you know, A, B, C are the walls of a room, and I split the room right down a line, and we stand on that line in the middle of the room, if we race to the wall, assuming we're the same speed, we should travel the exact same distance. I mean, we're going to travel the same distance regardless of speed, but it's the same distance either way. And again, I really want to put in your head that this is a symmetry line. So you can visualize this line being folded out over on itself and landing on the other side so all the measurements should transfer over. Now, same thing as up above. The converse is also true. I'm not going to redraw this. I'm going to use their picture. But if maybe I don't know, like right now, I do not know for sure that PC is an angle bisector. I don't have any markings here, so I'm unsure. But once I see the distance to the wall is equal, then I can go backwards and say, oh, aha, you must have been. This line's a really special line. It must be a bisector. Where the original theorem says, oh, well, if you're a bisector, then this distance must be equal. So it's just kind of one's going one way, one's going the other way. All right, let's knock out a couple of these problems so that I can get you started on the practice work and we can really start getting our hands dirty. It's one thing to learn from watching me. It's another thing to learn getting after it yourself and making mistakes and getting corrected. All right, find the measure of LM. Well, I look at my picture. One thing I know for sure is I see these little markings down here. So yes, sir, KM is an angle bisector. That's a fact. So from the theorem, theorem, if KM is an angle bisector, then I know any point that lives on that mid midway line there should be equal distance to each side. So if J to M is 12.8, L to M should be 12.8. That one was pretty easy, just numbers, no algebra. All right, next one. This one's a little bit tougher. It says, the me find the measure of ABD. Well, first of all, let's figure out who that is. I got to go f with my finger, with my pen, I got to go from A to B to D. So from A to B to D, we're talking about this angle right here. I need to find the measure of that angle. That, that's who ABD is. Well, I'm given that from A to B to C, a all the way to B all the way to C, so A to B to C, this whole angle here, I'm given that that is 112 degrees. Well, if you're an angle bisector, I should be able to split that in half. I should be able to go 112 divided by 2. What's that? 56. So it looks like the measure of angle ABD is 56 degrees. And if we wanted to find some side lengths, we'd have to do some trigonometry, which we're going to learn in chapter, I believe, 8 or 9. So that's coming down the pipeline. Last problem, just same thing, apply some algebra. Um, right now, I do not know that SU is, is an angle bisector. Okay, I'm looking at this line. I'm saying, man, I think you're an angle bisector, but I really don't have any markings here to tell me that. But I do notice that there's a point that lives on the line that's equal distance from the sides of the angle. So I'm like, well, hey, if you're equal distance from the sides, then you must be an angle bisector. So to find out how much each angle is, I have to set these two equal to each other. You know, since the measure of angle one is congruent or equal, not congruent, it's kind of a, I shouldn't write it like that. Angles are congruent, but the measures of angles are equal. If the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle two, then 5z plus 23 has to equal 6z plus 14. And now I'm going to get after some algebra. I'm going to minus this 5z from both sides. Boom. That gives me 23 equals z plus 14. Then I'm going to subtract 14 from both sides. I'm actually showing the steps on this one. I don't usually do this, but I'll show these algebra steps. And I find out that z equals 9. Now, on the test, the answer A might be 9 if it's a multiple choice. And you might be like, oh, cool, I got my answer. You did all that great work. But look at what they wanted. They wanted what is the measure of TSU. So TSU is this angle right here. So what I need to do is I need to take this 9 and plug it in for Z. So I need to do 5 times 9, not Z, because I found out what Z was, and add it to 23. 
So 45 plus 23, I believe, is 68 degrees. Now, that'll hook me up because the other side is 68 degrees. If I needed this angle up here, I could get it because I have 90 plus 68. 90 plus 68, that's a buck 58. And subtract that from 180. If I really needed to, I could tell you that that angle up top is 22. So you should be able to open all the doors once you get that, that second angle because you automatically have the 90. <clears throat> all right. Well, hopefully you uh you followed this lesson somewhat you'll get some chances to ask questions in class about these examples but your homework is going to look very similar to these examples with different numbers um, so if you get stuck on your practice homework make sure that you go back and look at these examples all right see you